Even if an investor says no to you, I wouldn't take that too personally. It could simply be, we just don't have enough chemistry. All the technologies are helping startups scale and grow cheaply without humans. Relationship with every single consumer. Personalize that relationship. Tell you and you and you what will make your hair shine. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am the only thing that's standing between you and that martini. So hopefully I'll make this quick and fun. Um, so my name is Joanne. I'm uh, an investor, a partner at Foundation Capital. We are a 23-year-old venture firm. We've been investing in companies for a long time, early stage companies. Uh, we have companies like Netflix and Lending Club and Sunrun, Mobile Iron, a bunch of 27 public companies in our portfolio. And we got involved with these people when they were a team of five or ten, a PowerPoint presentation, and a big dream. So oftentimes I get asked the question, how do venture capitalists pick these companies, right? This is, uh, this is you guys are very, very good at predicting. So today, I'm hoping to give you a snapshot of what we do as a venture capital firm. Uh, part of it is that we spend a lot of time thinking through macro trends, macro problems that we want to solve. And I'll give you a flavor of that in just a second. One theme is around artificial intelligence. And the other part is about the founders, the team, uh, the technology. And I also, also save some time at the very end to give you some advice around fundraising, around the venture landscape and how to build a business. That sound good? Awesome. All right, so uh, that's us. Uh, I talked about the 23 uh, years of investing. So first, I'll, I'll spend the first half uh, discussing a trend that we've been, we've been investing uh, around AI. I spend a lot of my time thinking through software and how it's going to change. And my thesis is that if you look at the last 10 years of enterprise software, trillions and trillions of dollars have been created with workflow-based solutions. And when I say workflow-based, I mean companies that look at human behavior and categorize processes. Right? Salesforce is a perfect example of that. Salesforce takes what salespeople do, and they encourage to do more of that. Right? And NetSuite, uh, Oracle, all these companies gather human behavior and put them in processes. In the next decade, I believe that software be will become self-driving, which means that software will, will actually replace some of the processes that humans are doing. And this will create so much more value than the last 10 years has seen. So now you ask, what are the things that we look for when we invest in artificial intelligence-based solutions? And there are three main keys to this. The first is that I look for companies that rethink the human and machine interactions. How many of you guys have watched Westworld? So for those of you who haven't, 
Westworld is, is a show uh, that has an amusement park filled with robots that act like humans. And the humans in the show interface with these robots the way that they interface with other humans. In the old world, humans had to speak the language of machines to interact with them. I look for companies that let humans interact with machines in, their, in the human language. In conversational AI, which is a trend I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, this pre is presented in two ways. What, the first example is rethinking the human and machine interaction. So, so for example, if I tell Alexa, hey Alexa, uh, play me a song, Alexa interprets what I'm telling her and does an action, right? That's one flavor of this. The other flavor is that the bot observes two humans interacting with each other. So for example, my husband and I, we may have a big fight. Alexa may sit there and listen to this fight. Alexa may also decide which one of us scored a good point and which of us is the ultimate winner. So that's the second, that's the second version of, of a conversational AI and how we think about man-to-machine interfaces. The second key to the AI world is around data. You guys have heard a lot about data. But if you look at the large companies today, Facebook is a media company, one of the largest media companies, and yet knows, owns no content. Airbnb is one of the largest hotel chains in the world, and yet knows, own, owns no real estate. Uber is one of the largest taxi companies, and yet owns no vehicles. These are all data companies. They take data, they collect data, they do interesting things, they, sur they surface interesting insights, and as a result, they have turned business, businesses and business models on their heads. The third key in the AI world is rethinking the technology stack. AI workloads are very, very different from traditional workloads. So everything from applications to middleware to infrastructure is going to change to accommodate this new workload, which means a whole new category of startups are going to emerge to do this. So chatbots is an example of a, a technology that have these three keys. A lot of new data, a new interface, and a whole new tech stack. I started looking at chatbots probably seven years ago when I, uh, when, I, when I spent time in China, right? China was a very early adopter of messaging. And WeChat it, you know, has a lot of uh, users in China. So whenever I'm in China, I use WeChat to do everything. Everything from ordering McDonald's to calling a taxi or a DD to paying utilities bills even. And this was years and years ago. Everything through a chat interface. I know most of you guys have seen what a chatbot looks like, but I'm just going to give a really quick example today. Uh, who here loves wine, by the way? All right. Well. I love wine as well. Who's an expert on wine? So I, I don't know very, know very much about wine, but I do know that I love to drink it. And I had this issue a few weeks ago when I was throwing a dinner party. I wanted to buy, I wanted to buy wine. So I got on Facebook Messenger. I asked Vinery, the chatbot, to help me with this. Vinery asked me what was the occasion and what kind of food I was having, and it gave me a couple of suggestions. I picked one and bought the wine all in this chat interface. How easy was that? Another example, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was staying at a hotel, and I wanted to work out, so I asked Edward, the chatbot, where the gym was. Edward told me. After my workout, I came back to my hotel room, and I needed shampoo, so I told Edward. 15 minutes later, shampoo was delivered to my room by Matt, the human. So a little bit of history. As you guys know, messaging has become the predominant way that consumers interact with each other. In 2015, it surpassed social network as an interface. Today, more than 3 billion people in the world use messaging in the top four messaging apps in a given month. That's half the world. 
In addition, these messaging apps have become platforms. And that's like the third, the, the middle layer that you see on the screen here. And what do I mean by a platform? It means that third-party developers can build chatbots on top of these mes messaging apps. Now, why are chatbots so interesting, so talked about, so powerful? And, ex and I'll explain that in the context of mobile apps. Today, almost every single enterprise has a mobile app. Chatbots are even more powerful than, than mobile apps for two main reasons. One is around distribution. One of the biggest barriers to mobile app adoption is that as a consumer, you have to go and download an app. It is the most annoying thing. With chatbots, you can just go on one of the messaging apps, call the chatbot, and switch from one chatbot to another completely seamlessly. In addition, each of the messaging apps has billions and billions of people using them already. So it's a huge distribution. The second reason why chatbots are so powerful is because of data. Right? Chatbots use data that they have collected from the conversation, in addition to data that it can get from other different places, like CRMs, CRMs or the web or social networks, and pulls it all together. So in my example, Edward knew that I wanted shampoo because I told him. Edward also knew that I wanted Pantene shampoo because he saw that I liked Pantene's Facebook page. And he brought me Pantene shampoo. So it's no surprise that enterprises are going to build chatbots to interface with their customers, right? And because of that, there is a huge opportunity that has emerged for startups. Everything from end-to-end -end applications, from app development platforms, from developer toolkits, to analytics, and a bunch of others. I think this category is going to be bigger than the web infrastructure category. As investors, we have been studying this space for five years now and have had the pleasure of investing in three companies, Maya, which is a recruiting AI, which eliminates 75% of a recruiter's time in the blue-collar space, Hustle, and Radiance Labs as three companies. And I'll talk more about them a little bit later. Now, how big, big is this opportunity for enterprises, you may ask? And I think it's massive. It's massive, massive in two different ways. One is because I think chatbots can eliminate a tremendous amount of cost today. Companies spend about $174 billion on salaries for customer service reps, for uh, recruiting, for insurance reps, for financial services reps. And I think chatbots can eliminate about 40% of that today. That is $65 billion of cost savings right now. The other part of it, which will become even more exciting on a going forward basis, is uh, chatbots will allow enterprises to offer services that were way too expensive before. So if you take my Pantene example, Pantene never had a direct-to-consumer relationship. It didn't have a, a, a relationship with you or me. It didn't know what I liked. Instead, it sold through retailers because that was much cheaper. Pantene gave retailers 20% margins or more. Now, with chatbots, Pantene can have a relationship with every single consumer, personalize that relationship, tell you and you and you what will make your hair shine, and sell Pantene all through this interface. Over time, it will take back the 20% margin it has given to retailers. And, and this kind of potential doesn't apply to just CPG or recruiting. It spans across different industries and use cases. In retail, in hospitality, in financial services, in B2B, there are use cases that you and I haven't yet imagined today. So this was actually a presentation that I gave to my partners many, many years ago when I first started looking at this space. Uh, this is verbatim. Nothing was changed. Right? This is how I described one opportunity. Now, we do this over and over again internally. 
not just for chatbots, but also for computer vision, for cryptocurrencies, for self-driving cars, for everything related to how do you think about the next decade of self-driving software. That's on the macro aspect. How do we identify interesting problems to solve? Now I'm going to shift the conversation to the other aspect, which is founders. Founders, fundraising, how do we think about you guys? And hopefully I'll give you some tips on navigating the venture realm as well as fundraising and more importantly, company building. So venture capital 10 years ago used to be more of an island. Right? There's Sand Hill Road, if you want to fundraise, it's a scarce resource, you go up and down Sand Hill and you meet everybody that you will potentially want to meet. In the last decade, a ton of new entrants entered venture and it became really, really, really crowded. Founders, you better be good at the Game of Thrones. Now, what has happened in the last decade for all this change? Three macro trends. One is that interest rates have been really, really low, right? And so if you're an investor and you're thinking about where to put money, you don't want to put it in banks because that's going to give you, you know, pretty low returns. You look at venture and you think, wow, this, this could be really lucrative. So if you're greedy, you're thinking, hey, I should put my money there. The second thing that has happened is it has never been cheaper or easier to start and scale a company. Global, social, mobile, one-click one purchase, all the technologies are helping startups scale and grow cheaply without humans. The third thing that has happened is that startups are staying private longer. And when startups stay private longer, it means that they need more private capital to fund this, this life cycle. Going public is actually quite cumbersome and it has become less and less attractive for a lot of people. And so as a result, more and more venture dollars are deploying to ca into startups staying private. Now, these non-traditional investors, people who used to not invest in venture, saw these three trends and entered the venture market. Everybody from private equity funds, mutual funds, hedge funds, investors in China, they're all deploying capital into startups. Even my mother became a Kickstarter donor or, or funder. I was shocked. So what has happened is $75 billion have been deployed into startups in 2017. That was three times as much as in 2010. It has never been so awesome to be in your shoes. But it has also never been so dangerous. Because of the amount of capital that has been funding startups, valuations, private market valuations, have gone way up to a point where there is a huge gap between private market valuations and public market valuations. And at some point in time, those two valuations will converge, and somebody, founders and investors alike, will be the ones that are going to be hurting, the ones who are going to be losing a lot of money. So as a founder, what should you do in this market? Well, one, you should definitely go raise a lot of money because it's a great time. But second, you should keep a couple things in mind so that when the market corrects itself, you are still going strong, you are surviving, you have built a lasting, enduring business. And here are a couple tips. So first on the fundraising side. In a given week, I probably meet 10 to 15 companies. My firm in a given year probably meets thousands, right? So, you know, you're sitting in our offices, 45 minutes, your goal is to get the next 45 minute meeting. What do we look for in the pitch? Well, four things. First, a problem statement. In the case of Maya, which I mentioned earlier, which is a company that we back in the conversational AI space, Maya realized that blue collar, high frequency recruiting was very, very expensive, very labor intensive, and companies spend over $100 billion per year doing that, right? Huge market. The second, the second part is a secret. And this is probably the most important part in the pitch. A secret that you have and that you, uni you, you uniquely have that nobody else has. And this could be because you have spent X number of years in an industry and you're an industry expert. 
It could be that your grit is so, you know, over the top compared to everyone else. It could be that the combination of you and your co-founders is a null set if you compare to other teams, a secret. The third part is a story. And this is really, really important and part of the pitch that uh, investors can, can actually look at, which is what is your storytelling capabilities? It's not so much that we want to be entertained, but we do want to feel confidence that you're able to tell a good story to us and to the executives that you're going to hire, to your customers, to other investors. You have to be a good storyteller in that 45 minutes. And the last part is just some proof, some proof that your secret is starting to result into some kind of data. Data could be traction, could be revenues, could be customers, POCs, whatever it is, that your secret is is real and working. Now, don't forget, I think I wanted to mention these three things, because founders come to me and oftentimes they say, hey, I am the best in this market, in, in my market. And I think that's not the way that you should look at it. Because if you think about our competitive set, you know, we're looking at a couple thousand companies per year, and we fund between six and 12. So your competitive set is actually the thousands of companies per year that we're funding, or th that we're seeing, not the two startups and three incumbents in your world, right? So how do you stand out in that competitive set? The second part that I think is, is good to keep in mind is that there's tons and tons of different investors that I showed in my prior, prior uh, map. There's the traditional venture funds. Uh, within the traditional venture funds, there's those who love certain industries. There's also the seed funds and micro VCs and non-traditional investors. And all these different investor types actually have very different goals. So for us, our goal is to invest in and build companies that have the opportunity to go public. Not necessarily has to go public, but has the opportunity to do so. And that means they need to get scale. This is a 10 plus year commitment. Uh, this is how we measure success in our fund. That's what we tell our investors. Many other types of investors don't have the same kind of goals, right? Some of them invest in companies because it's a good mission. Some of them have uh, had this personal experience in their life, which the company you know, could resonate with. Some of them have a two to three X return and want to get out in three or four years. So I think you should, you should keep the end goal in mind because your audience could change dramatically depending on who you're talking to. And as a result, I think you should think about having multiple decks, multiple messages. You can tell the same story, but just keep your audience in mind. And the last part, which I think founders underestimate, is the chemistry of these relationships. Fundraising is not any dissimilar from dating and getting married. Um, a lot of it is about personal chemistry. Does the investor and the founder get along? Do they enjoy spending time? Do they have mutual respect? And, and that part of it is a little bit intangible, a little bit hard to measure, hard to predict. And so even if an investor says no to you, I wouldn't take that too personally. It could simply be, we just don't have enough chemistry. Now, don't forget the basics of company building. Fundraising is, is great. It's a skill. It's an art and a science. Company building is what's most important. And I just want to mention three, three things. One is around hiring. One of the most impressive things I see that, that founders and CEOs do is to be able and comfortable hiring above their weight class. When I see a team, an executive team, that the founders have put together, and I think, man, how did, how did he or she manage to get these people around the table? That is the best sign, the best sign. The second part is there has been a lot of emphasis on growth, right? Grow at all costs. And I think that's a function because the markets are so good. Fundraising, uh, financing dollars are, are, are plentiful. Uh, and you get rewarded for growth more than profitability. But don't forget that growth at the end of the day, has to get to a point of profitability. You have to make money as a business at, at some point. So you think about 
building a $100 million revenue business, how much capital do you need to do that? Let's just say $100 million. You could spend 75 of it unprofitable and growing the business, but you've got to get to a point at the end of it where you can make a case that you're going to be a sustainable business. Think of capital raising and growing a business as a 10-year journey and how you allocate capital throughout that 10, that 10 years versus just the one or two years. And I think the most important part of building a business is really to build a religion. Startups are your religions. The founders are the preachers of this religion. What you do, what you decide in terms of transparency, of compensation, how you deal with hierarchy, whom you hire, you're affecting this culture, this religion that you're building. For us at Foundation Capital, we are fellow travelers. That's how we see ourselves. To emphasize that, every single meeting that an entrepreneur has with us, after the meeting, we send them an NPS survey. Because we keep on reminding ourselves that the customer, the entrepreneurs, are first and foremost, and they are our North Stars. And that is our religion. And if you can successfully build a religion, I think the rest of it will be a lot easier. So thank you guys for spending time with me. Um, I covered, I gave you a flavor of what we do from a problem statement perspective, gave you some tidbits around financing, and then talked about company building. You should go out and raise money. If you're an awesome and very passionate entrepreneur with an awesome mission statement, and an awesome story, I'd love to hear at some point. Thank you, guys.